Hi folks, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Payal and I am a traveler who also loves to meet people. And I think a blend of both is where this concept of melting pot has come about. In my melting pot series, I will be talking to lots of inspiring people from different parts of the world and also from different cultures whom I meet during all my travels. The common factor between these folks will be the desire to follow their passion and make it a way of life. So step into this melting pot and enjoy the chats. Hi folks, it's a big hello from Saigon. Um, I arrived here this morning and I'm already at work. Um, so today I'm in conversation with Jerome. Uh, Jerome has, well, he has a day job as a lawyer and, and then he's very recently started um, a cafe called uh, Tartine and, you know, and I think he has a passion for baking. Um, so probably that's what prompted it. If not, then he's going to correct me and tell me what exactly, uh, you know, prompted him um, to start this cafe and how long he's been in Vietnam for. And, you know, I'll just leave him to tell us his story. So firstly, thank you, Jerome, uh, for, you know, in the middle of the day uh, from your busy schedule coming uh, to talk to me. And um, I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. So Hi. Likewise, and thank you. Welcome to sunny Saigon. <laughs> thank uh, you. Because it's always sunny, and this is why I enjoy living here um, so much. So to try to answer a few of the questions you asked, yeah. I've been in Vietnam for a bit more than 15 years. I've lived in Hanoi for eight years, and it's been a bit more than uh, seven here. Okay. And um, so where did you move from? I Oh, that's complicated. Nothing is simple here. <laughs> Um, for yeah, about that's a what makes it more exciting, right? And that's why melting pot, because I talk to people who are, um, you know, who don't have like a simple life. Uh, they have a story. That's where the story comes in, I guess. Okay, so let's... Um, I'm, I'm French. I was um, raised and born in France. I started working as a lawyer. Okay. And... And after a burnout, because lawyers do that as well, not only bankers, <laughs> I decided to leave everything behind, take my bicycle, fly to Hong Kong and start cycling. Oh. Which I did for about six months, over 10,000 plus kilometers from wow. Hong Kong to KL. Okay. Through many routes. So why Asia? Why Asia? Because I had never been to Asia, because okay. I needed a break. I needed something simple, something where the weather wouldn't be too much of an issue and mm -hmm. it would be warm enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the right time of the year to do it. Right. And, uh, and I just jumped on, on the first idea I had, really. Right. And I, I really liked it. Yeah. Uh, and it, you did this on your own? I Yeah, 99% on my own. Okay. Uh, the remainder was... Uh, Travel, travel uh, cameras who didn't stick very long, <laughs> but it was it was fun. It was very interesting. I, yeah. I discovered as well that I didn't like to travel alone, and oh. I don't think I would again. Okay, to be really honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that took me to Hanoi, mm -hmm. uh, where I stayed a couple of weeks on this trip and, and met very nice people, liked the city very much. And at the back of my mind, I said, you know, I would be back at some point. So I went back to Europe after my trip, started. Uh, something which has nothing to do with my legal profession. A startup in the service business with a friend of mine, which made me share my time between Slovenia, where our designers were, East Africa, where some of our operations were, right. uh, the south of France, where my partner and I uh, had their family and where we liked living. Right. Philadelphia, the East Coast, where my girlfriend was living at the time. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, oh my God. and the British Caribbeans, where some of our operations were based as well. Okay. So that lasted for about a year and a half, where you know the administration took over the launching of the project, where I right. could be anywhere as, as long as I had a, an internet connection. Right. And right. I decided that Hanoi would be a good place to do that. Mm -hmm. So I came here. Find, found out that administration wasn't really what I liked, and I, you know, uh, unplugged my uh, participation to that project as as committed uh, right. at the end of the commission commitment period. Right. And went back to my legal profession. Uh, okay. Did 
uh, interesting transactions as a lawyer. In But is it um, easy for you, because you haven't studied law in Vietnam, uh, but can you practice without... So here I'm registered as a foreign lawyer. Okay, uh, this is, so There is possible. a framework okay. for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Vietnamese legal system is fairly similar to the civil, civil law jurisdictions. Okay. So there are some, some areas where you connect. And, and at the time I arrived in 2004, uh, the um, volume of laws which were available was fairly limited as compared to what it is today. So it oh, was, okay. yeah. you know, retrospectively very easy to get yeah, into the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I did, and, and, you know, very interesting times. That was a time where Vietnam was uh, integrating into the, the global economy with accession to the WTO, many transactions, very, very interesting transactions right. um, I worked on. And um, after a few years in Hanoi, I started feeling that um, pollution was was getting worse. Um, I was getting fed up with the weather, which if you've been to Hanoi, you I understand have. that yeah. it's not great, yeah. except yeah. between mid-October and mid-December. Yeah. yeah, And so I moved down to Ho Chi Minh City, where I had a, I had a, a fa not a family project, but a personal project here. It's okay. my, my life partner. Okay. And I've been here since then, enjoying it very much. Mm -hmm. And sourdough, because that's about sourdough. Not only baking, this is about sourdough. Sourdough yeah. is very addictive. Right. Yeah. Very addictive way of baking. I, and for the small story, again, I was working at a bakery when I was 11 that was at the border between France and Italy okay. in the mountains. Okay. Uh, I was doing that on the weekend, 6 a.m. to noon, uh, and on the school holidays. Right. I didn't need to do it. It yeah. was just fun, you know, and my right. parents let me do it, and it was meaningful, so I did it. And so from then, I've always enjoyed, you know, playing with uh, flour, dough, water. Mm -hmm. and, and I've always baked at home, like once in a while, every month, every three months. Right. Uh, I wasn't doing great, actually. <laughs> until, until about a three, week, three years ago, I, I, I don't know why I started, you know, making my, my sourdough starter, which is the base for baking sourdough. Right. Which you need to feed every day, every, uh, every six, eight hours. Oh, okay. It's an intense yeah. process. Because I know I have sourdough bread, but I have no idea what the process is. I would have liked to actually <laughs> share some with you, but I didn't say there long enough. And yeah, and so I started baking regularly on the weekend. In the beginning, I was, you know, giving away my bread, which wasn't great, to be really honest, mm. uh, to my friends and the family around and, and neighbors. Right. And then I got better at it, but right. I was really really passionate I, I was I mean I was waking up in the middle of the night and starting new recipes and dreaming about baking wow. um, on the side of my very busy schedule which right. is probably why I got so enthusiastic about something else than yeah. what I was doing on the day to day it, it helps you to sort of unwind exactly. right? yeah yeah and uh, about yeah that was about a year ago I, I bought a new oven which was bigger not a great oven but something which enabled me to on the weekend bake well in the end I was baking up to 50 60 lofts wow. on the weekend wow and I was so I started selling my production because I was bored with giving away yeah, uh, yeah. all uh, the hard all, work all right? the hard work <laughs> and the ingredients because yeah. quality ingredients here are imported and not very easy to source and, and not cheap right um, so by yeah by the By the months of by the yeah by the end of October, beginning of November, I had you know people who were calling me and said you know can you make bread for me and I was refusing many orders and I felt that that was the right time to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my life partner uh, owns restaurants here. Oh, okay. Uh, she's okay. got uh, three plus plus starting. Starting. Okay. Uh, so she's your uh, co she's the co-founder. She's the co-founder okay. and she's okay. running it. I am she's actually not. It. I'm only making sure at Tartin that the sourdough bread right. is Right. That's good. your that's, that's <laughs> sort of your the, area. The rest, of the rest is, is yeah. not yeah. interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> coffee is good there and I make yeah. sure that the coffee is good as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the story basically. Um, so is your uh, What is your, you know, your, your normal lifestyle diet? Are you, do you eat? Uh, because I've, I've noticed that in Saigon, a lot of people are now focusing on plant-based food. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of restaurants and cafes and, you know, people are just talking about plant-based food. So the fact that you, you do sado, you know, does it because it's the healthier bread, right? So, so sado is healthier. Yeah. Um, 
mainly because of the process, the fer long fermentation process, which is used to make sourdough bread, which right. transforms the gluten into the into the flour, into the, right, the, right, right, in a way which is more digestible. Okay. So very often you'd find that gluten intolerant people who yeah. can actually eat normal sourdough bread yeah. just because the gluten has been transformed in a way which is more digestible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that's it's one thing. So it's not gluten free. It's, it's not gluten free. Oh, no, no. Because I, I, I only have sourdough because I have gluten intolerance and uh, so I just assumed that it was okay. So no, no, there is a lot of gluten in in gluten in the in the bread, but yeah. it's transformed in a way which is more digestible. Hmm. The bread. I mean, bread is in only general, is only yeah. flour, water, yeah. and salt. Therefore, it's vegan. Right. And uh, and yeah. So this is one thing. I'm not I'm not vegan. I'm not vegetarian either. But okay. I, as I get older, I tend to see that my body reacts much better to uh, plants than animal uh, products. Yeah. And I and I do enjoy this. So at Tartin, we uh, we brew our own kombucha. Okay. We uh, prepare a variety of vegan breads, including hummus, including pesto, including arisa, including chili jam, okay. including most recently something I'm working on and that will be released very soon. It's fermented uh, sourdough plus soya ricotta. So it's oh. the end product is a type of ricotta. ricotta. It's, it's, okay. it's very tasty, mm. so and it's and it's fermented with the sourdough. Mm. So it's it's very interesting and very tasty. So you're experimenting with. So it. I'm experimenting okay. and I'm, I'm planning in the next two or three days to yeah. have it ready for selling at tartine on the sandwiches and uh, and tartines and ciabatta that we yeah. offer as sandwiches. Yeah. Um, and sell it in jars for people who want to take it home and, and enjoy a nice slice of sourdough bread with a vegan nice. um, ricotta. Uh, ricotta or yeah. all the yeah. spreads. Oh, nice. That's interesting. You're listening to a fusion of stories recounted for the first time ever by some fascinating people from across the globe with me, Payo, on this very unique and special podcast series, Melting Pot. So um, when I was at your uh, cafe, and of course we couldn't do the recording there because of the music and, um, you know, and all the different sounds, but um, I noticed that, and we talked about it on our way here, about the, the house. So actually it's it's a house which you're converting into, so will it be just a cafe or because it's got multiple floors? It's so what, what are you planning to do with that space? I think the best way to describe the plan we have is that we don't have a plan. <laughs> Or well, the plan we had has actually turned out into something else. Something uh, else completely. So right. there will probably be an office at some point. Oh. Part of it will be office. Okay. Uh, part of it will be extension of the current um, yeah. baking lab. Ah, uh -huh. okay. And um, and you know maybe a restaurant on the rooftop. Okay. Because the other restaurants that um, my life partner runs are actually rooftop restaurants. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So she has this in her blood, you know. She needs to put a <laughs> restaurant Sorry, on any on rooftop she <laughs> sees. Um, so, yeah, it's not very clear yet, but, you know, it's okay, been, as long it's as you been have the house space. is not completed, as you've seen. Yeah. You know, we start yeah. operating on the ground floor and the first floor and yeah. above it's a bit of a mess yeah, with yeah. open walls and stuff. Yeah. So this will be sorted in about a month. Okay. And from then, I think we will take it step by step and make the plan fit with the space. To what? Okay. And uh, so you were talking about your baking lab. Uh, so currently, how many people do you have, you know, um, baking for you? Um, so we have currently seven bakers. Okay. Including a head baker who is... Who is not you. It's not me. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I like to call myself non-executive baker <laughs> baking consultant something like this right. otherwise i get i get drawn into baking in the middle of the night which i don't like anymore yeah yeah, yeah right right um yeah. and so he is a very interesting he has a very interesting profile he, he's vietnamese but he has spent the last six years overseas baking uh, in australia and more most recently in new zealand Okay. Doing two years at a sourdough at a bakery which does only sourdough as we do. Right. So he's very passionate about what he does. Okay. Um, he is very international because he's traveled overseas. Yeah. And um, and, he, and he, he enjoys baking sourdough very much. So he right. wouldn't do anything else. 
Right. And so it's very good to be able to bounce ideas with him. Yeah. Uh, work on new recipes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and he's he's a nice person as well. So I enjoy working with him. Yeah. You need to have. Uh, I mean, you know, you need to have passionate people around you uh, to actually see it through. You know, um, and and that's good. I mean, it's. I mean, it's a very nice uh, comfortable space and I saw a lot of people working there as well so it it and the nice music in the background and all of that can make it quite interesting and then of course the sardo bread and the good coffee um, uh, you know only complements the whole whole situation so hmm. so are you looking at replicating tartine in another area another space doing something different I'd love to, honestly. I'd love to see the, what we've created being replicated and living beyond what it is now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like it to still stay something at human scale, not something big. Okay. Uh, I don't think there is any space anyway or any possibility for it to grow, overgrow right, um, quickly. Right, I right. mean, over time maybe, but the Vietnamese are used to eat bread, but not necessarily used to eat sourdough. sourdough it's very, yeah. stra- it's a very strange taste for them, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sourness in the bread. So I would say that 5% perhaps of the population is really keen on, you know, this kind of bread. Mm. But the good thing is that the Vietnamese, as they develop, I mean, as the society develops and, and, and people get access to more opportunities to go overseas, right. uh, to read, to read about international things. Internationalized, basically, they get more curious, and, right. and they are very curious about food. In, in anyway, you're meeting other people who are in the yeah. food industry, yeah. and you'll see that people are interested in, you know, uh, Middle Eastern food yeah. or. Uh, U.S. barbecue yeah. uh, type. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, there are you know patterns that the Vietnamese go for. What uh, U.S. What? barbecue? It's a lot of meat. Vietnamese love meat, so mm-hmm. they would you know this. There is this thing. Um, same for Middle Eastern food. Right. Uh, there is meat. There is yeah. there is there are spices, and it's so this, there is there is a connection there. Mm-hmm. You've met with the founders of Lebanese, and they are plant based. Uh, vegetarian type of food yeah. is resonating very well in the in the in the ears of of the locals in because there is a tradition here of eating no animal products once a month oh, and there okay. is a month uh, which generally falls in in August as well where people go for uh, vegetarian or vegan Okay, so as, is it, as part is of the, it it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a Confucianist uh, ah, tradition. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Because I also interviewed um, this young woman who's Vietnamese, but she was born and brought up in Ukraine, and uh, she was talking about how um, her she's uh, it's called raw berry. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Anya, and she was ah yeah yeah I've met her yeah met her. And she's making cakes raw vegan cakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she completely changed her her diet uh, from being a heavy, you know, typical Vietnamese meat eater because that's what was always served on the table to raw food. Um, so I can see that uh, there's a, you know, gradually. I mean, every time I come, I feel like there are more and more people talking about it. But also, other than Vietnamese, I think there's a lot of foreigners who live in Ho Chi Minh, right? So. Something like this would be appealing for them as well. Sure, right? sure, and, yeah. and I think as anywhere else, people, as I do, people realize that there is no sustainability for the planet, yeah. but also for your own body to yeah. be eating too much meat yeah, yeah. and too much animal products. So I think that's a normal trend. It's a, there is a bit of fashion in it, mm-hmm. as any, as everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. But I think there is also something real happening, and and this is a definite definitely real trend which is mm. which we see here interesting yeah wow that was good <laughs> it was a good chat i learned a few things about sardo especially uh, what i eat but i had no idea what goes into it i need to uh, find a way to get you loft before you go yeah i'd love to um so yeah we can we can figure that out something that you've baked though oh okay <laughs> that's gonna be a bit more difficult <laughs> I actually baked last night. I baked. Uh, I prepared a couple of loaves which were meant to be baked early this afternoon. I haven't seen them yet. Okay. I'm experimenting. I always experiment when yeah, I bake. Yeah. So yeah. one was I call it a Mediterranean loaf. So I integrated some pesto okay. and some uh, herbs into the dough. Okay. Uh, and the other one, uh, haven't given it a name yet, 
but there were some seeds as well as chili. Oh. Fresh chili. Wow. Red chili into the dough. Wow. Uh, so Interesting. I'm, I'm, yeah. really, I'm really curious to see how it, <laughs> how it turns out. Oh. I'm sure it's going to be good. Yeah, I can see that. If, if I don't manage to get you a loaf of these two or yeah. a slice of these two, because I, I really want to have some, I'll, I'll, I'll send you pictures in any case. Oh my God, <laughs> you can't do this to me. <laughs> okay, I'll have to, I guess. I'm going to now try and make sure that you send me a loaf. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerome. It's been great talking to you and I'm sure my listeners um, will enjoy this conversation as well. Um, and good luck with Tartine, and I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Thank you very much, and I invite all your listeners to come and visit Ho Chi Minh City and Vietnam more generally. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah. It's a place that you need to see at least once in your life. Yeah, true. I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much. Jerome has a very interesting life. I am so amazed at how he manages his stressful life as a lawyer and then ends up spending hours and hours and hours experimenting with and baking sourdough breads. Unfortunately, time did not permit and he was unable to send the loaf for me to sample on this very trip, but I'm sure the next time I'll take up his offer. Cafe Tartine has a really nice relaxed feel to it. Do check it out on your next trip to Saigon. And of course, do make it a point to try Jerome's special Sado creations. This is Pyle signing off. Until the next episode of Mel